Yes, I'd like to uh, thank the organisers for inviting me to speak and um, I, uh, I'm going to talk about the uncertainty factor which is a, a fresh way of expressing uh, measurement uncertainty that's applicable in certain situations. Um, so I'm going to uh, uh, initially talk about expressing measurement uncertainty in general and then try and describe this uncertainty factor. And to help with this um, generally, there's a new Eurochem leaflet that my working group's been working on uh, that has just been published on the Eurochem website. And there's a link to it down the bottom here. And quite a lot of this material I'm talking about is taken from that uh, leaflet. So I'm then gonna talk about how to calculate the uncertainty factor and then two worked examples. One, uh, which is a purely analytical component of the measurement uh, process and with GMO in maize flour, um, but I'm gonna talk about other analytical applications, microbiological, biological and contaminants in water and sediments a little bit. And then a second example where I'm gonna talk about uncertainty that includes that coming from the sampling process. And as we've discussed in earlier uh, talks, this is now um, in the ISO guide at 17025. It talks about including uncertainty from sampling. So this might be, give you some idea of how that's done as well. Then I'll talk a little bit about of using the uncertainty factor, how it's got advantages and challenges and how you can overcome them by, for example, comparing the uncertainty factor with relative uncertainty and then some conclusions and then hopefully some questions and answers. Right, so uncertainty of measurement, I'm sure you're all familiar with, and I think it's probably even more important than the measurement quantity value itself because it controls all the decisions you can make with it. Um, so we've got to get a good way of expressing the measurement uncertainty, especially when the traditional symmetric expanded uncertainty interval is not accurate. So that's where the uncertainty factor can be useful. Um, and I'm gonna explain the circumstances where it works. So I'm sure all, you all express your measurement uncertainty either as expanded uncertainty um, or relative expanded uncertainty, U prime, typically with a coverage factor of two for 95% confidence intervals. And then you express the uncertainty interval um, from the x plus or minus u where x is the measured quantity value and obviously plus minus so when we've got a range of values this expresses the range within which the measure and lies obviously that's equivalent to the true value of the analyte concentration and if we've got an example here of um a measurement of 50 plus or minus five milligrams a kilogram we can then count calculate the lower confidence limit, uh, 50 minus five, and the upper confidence limit, 50 plus five up there. So we get a nice symmetrical confidence interval. And this approach works well, we use it a lot, all of us, but it starts to break down when the measurement uncertainty is high, typically when the expanded uncertainty is over 40%. Um, and it can give, uh, rise to lower confidence limits that are below zero uh, as uh, um, as steve mentioned a little bit in his earlier talk and it doesn't work well when the frequency distribution of repeated measurements has a extreme positive skew so we're not de dealing with normal distributions anymore so the uncertainty factor is a, a way of expressing this distribution when the repeated measurements are approximately log normal so the expanded uncertainty factor uh, symbolized with the F capital U here is the more way, accurate way of expressing measurement uncertainty in these circumstances. So you express the measurement result as X times over F U, uh, the uncertainty factor. And that again is for K equals two. So for example here, 
with this measurement result of 50 for an uncertainty factor of two you calculate the lower confidence limit by dividing by two and then the upper confidence limit by multiplying by two so it's 100 down to 25 so you can see this is an asymmetric confidence interval and the nice thing about it is it can't give negative uh, confidence lower confidence limits which for most purposes is very useful um, obviously steve has pointed out that when you've got banned substances it might cause you some problems um, so how do you calculate the uncertainty factor well uh, the maths is that um, you have the standard deviation of the log transform measurements. Instead of the raw measurements, you log transform them and take the standard deviation. And then you calculate the exponent of that. So it's e to the sg, where sg is the standard deviation of the log normal transform. And here is sg is the standard deviation of the log transformed. And it's log to the base e is preferable. And the expanded external uncertainty factor, which is more useful for 95% confidence, is calculated as the exponential of 2SG, e to the 2SG. So I'm now going to give you some worked examples, the GMO in maize flour, where I'll show you how to calculate uncertainty factor manually in Excel. Uh, and then I'm going to show you an example of lead in contaminated soil taken from the Eurochem guide where the uncertainty factor is calculated automatically by applying ANOVA uh, to the duplicate method results. So here are some results uh, for a purely analytical system, GMO, gen genetically modified organism in maize flour. Um, and here are some results um, from a single PT round um, conducted in 2004 from, with 31 labs um, taking PCR measurements on the, the same test material. So you can see there's quite a scatter here and you can create a histogram here and it shows um, that we've got a heavy positive skew. This is not normal uh, approximating to a normal distribution. The units I'm using here are percent which obviously um, more rigorously would be mass fraction centigrams a gram but i'll use percent for short so what you can do to overcome this skew is you can take the uh, natural logarithms um, of each of these numbers and the command in excel is ln x where so we just put ln x in here and each number we can calculate its uh, log to the base e um, and if you plot a histogram of that, you can see it comes out much closer to being normal, which is good news. And then to calculate the uncertainty factor, we take the standard deviation of these numbers, 0.69. And then we apply the formulas I've just shown you. And here we've got the exponent of 0.69, which is 2. So that's the standard uncertainty factor. The expanded uncertainty factor is the exponent of 2 times 0.69, which is 3.98, which is basically 4. So this is quite a large um, uncertainty factor. So how do we apply this uncertainty factor to a single measurement result? So say we, we take a, a single measurement and it's 2% GMO, say it's here on this scale, then the measurement result would be two times over 4% GMO. So the lower confidence interval is two divided by four, which is uh, half a percent. And then the upper confidence limit is two times four, which is 8% GMO. So you can see here a very asymmetric confidence interval for where the true value might lie, the measurement. So the measurement uncertainty here reflects the uh, uncertainty of each PT result and it matches the real distribution, uh, which is uh, in this particular case is log normal, but not all GMO distributions are log normal. I'm just, this is this particular example. 
And again, there's no risk of uh, a negative um, lower confidence limit. If we had tried to use the uh, expanded uncertainty um, on when we use this single same measurement value of two, where would we have got? So here are the raw GMO results. If you had calculated the mean standard deviation and the expanded uncertainty, you get an expanded uncertainty of 155%, which is equal to 3.1% GMO. So now with the plus minus approach, you'd, the, um, you, that's the measurement result. And it results in a lower confidence limit here of two minus 3.1. So it's got a minus 1.1% GMO, which is obviously impossible. And the upper confidence limit would be two plus three, which is about five. And this is symmetrical, where obviously the original distribution of replicated measurements weren't. So here we have these negative uh, estimates of the lower confidence limit, which are obviously impossible. So I think you can see here, the use of the uncertainty factor is much more realistic expression of measurement uncertainty in this case. So since its publication um, by Steve and I and back in uh, 2015, people have been applying the uncertainty factor and here are some examples applied to purely analytical system. There was microbial contamination of pharmaceutical projects products in this publication down here and they got uncertainty factors for the analysis between 1.2 and 3 so 3 that's quite a high uh, level of uncertainty rapid microbiological methods um, were applied in this uh, paper um, and they got they described log normal distributions of the potency value and they got uncertainty factors between 1.08 and 1.13. Um, for contaminants in marine sediments, 29 PAHs, they got several log normal distributions where the uncertainty was exceeding 30% and recommended the use of uncertainty factors. And in river water, 25 contaminants, the uncertainty factors went up from 1.1 to 2.1. And 13 of the contaminants were over this 1.4 where you really need um, the uncertainty factor. So it's getting a uh, wider application in the analytical sphere. So um, I'm now going to talk about the second example, which is where we're using the uncertainty factor to express measurement uncertainty when you include uncertainty from measurement. And uh, there's a case study here and um, in a way, it's like a validation of a whole measurement process all the way from the lab out to the um, to the sampling. And if, obviously, if you're going to try something like this yourself, you'd have to collaborate with the sample organization. As Lawrence was talking this morning, um, you have to have an integrated approach. So this particular scenario, it's contaminated land near Heathrow Airport in West London, nine hectares being considered for potential housing. Um, and the contaminant of interest is lead. Um, the area of investigation was a 300 by 300 meter square. And we put in a hundred sampling targets um, and we took a hundred primary samples, each representing a 30 by 30 meter target. And this, the details of this are in the Eurochem guide. So at 10% of the targets to estimate the measurement uncertainty, instead of taking one, we took two samples, hence the duplicate method, to start estimating the uh, sampling component of the measurement uncertainty. And we took duplicate analyses on both of these samples to try and estimate analytical repeatability that contributes to the analytical uncertainty. So we took them uh, 10 out of 100 sampling targets, 10%, and we took them three meters away to, from the original sampling point within this same uh, sampling target to represent the variability um, that could have arisen had other people taken the same samples with the same protocol. And that's what the point this slide is making, that we are looking at the ambiguity in the sampling protocol, how different could it have been for different samplers relocating those same targets using 
the technology we used at that time back in the this was in the 90s tapes and compasses and it is the effect of small scale heterogeneity of the lead within the sampling target is causing uncertainty from sampling so the samples were dried and ground and acid digest and the lead determined by icp we had six certified reference materials to estimate analytical bias over the whole concentration range and it was found to be negligible for the application we're talking about now there's for further details in the guide we corrected for reagent blank when we found it statistically significant and the point that steve was making earlier we un we had untruncated data we didn't have any values less than detection of it we kept all the uh numbers uh and we didn't round them at all if people if this is rounded for example to three milligrams a kilogram a duplicate might appear to have perfect precision which obviously it didn't so looking at the results from the duplicated samples in this design this nested design here uh, here are the 10 targets where the duplicates were taken and you can see here d3 um you can see the sample one here there are about 600 ppm and sample two is only about 200 milligrams a kilogram so you can see we have got sampling heterogeneity here causing sampling uncertainty analytical duplicates were generally much closer agreement but we need to ex look at the sampling frequency distribution to see what's appropriate and when we look at all 100 sampling targets we see a very skewed distribution so as before if we take log to the base e we can then make something that approaches much more approximately log normal so that's for the variation across site within the sampling targets within between each duplicate this is a plot of that previous data from the slide so here are two s1 duplicates and s2 duplicates and you can see the big gap between them so it varies between the different duplicates but if we take the log transform data and we compare the duplicates in log space they become much more similarly distributed so there's a suggestion here that the measurement and certainly from sampling is log normally distributed as well so this log transformation it's useful uh, because ANOVA for example needs to a, a normal distribution and um, robust ANOVA can deal with 10% outliers but this is much larger uh, degree of skew so um, I will come to other advantages of log normality in a minute but one of the problems is that the original numbers that you had here that I showed you when we log transform them they're no longer in the input units so this causes a few issues um well I'll come to it in a minute so if we put those raw numbers into this software Renova 2 that comes from the analytical methods committee at this website down here for free um we plot those raw numbers in we can get um a, an estimate of the relative uncertainty is 86 percent but we know that's not reliable because this heavily skewed distribution what's much more reliable here is the uncertainty factor 2.62 which is calculated after automatic log transformation within the program so you can use transformation to the base 10 but as i said earlier base e has some advantages that i don't have time to discuss this ANOVA also gives you not just the uncertainty factor for the measurement, but it gives you the components here from the sampling, 2.6, so that's the dominant cause. And here there's the analytical, 1.12. And interestingly, if you have 1.12, that approximates to an analytical repeatability of about 12%. You take the one off, and that gives you a way of un understanding uncertainty factor, which I'll come back to in a minute. So for a typical value of uh, 300 milligrams a kilogram of lead at this site, what do the confidence limits look like? Well, there is the measurement value of 300. If we get the upper confidence limit by multiplying by 2.62, so that's 784, and the lower confidence limit by dividing by it, 
1.15. So you can see here this classic um, skewed distribution, um, asymmetric, um, and it reflects the skew in the original data. So I won't discuss this in detail, but if you try to use the symmetric confidence interval, this is what you get. And you can see it ignores the possibility of true values getting that far out. So it's not very accurate. Explaining the confidence interval, as you can see, is um, a challenge to get your head around. But one quick way of trying to get a, get a grasp on it is that there's a relate, an approximate relationship between the relative uncertainty and the uncertainty factor minus one in this equation here. For example, it, uncertainty factor of 1.05 is roughly equivalent to 5% rel expanded relative uncertainty. So you just take off one and multiply by 100. It's really 4.9, but that's close enough. 10 is really 9.5, even up to 1.2 uncertainty factor is roughly an expanded uncertainty of 20 percent it's really 18 but it gives you a, a, an intuitive feel for the uncertainty factor which i think is needed so you can see here how these two the uncertainty factor and the expanded uncertainty start off being similar and then this breaks down at high levels but for low levels it's actually quite useful and it's based on these calculations are based on an approximation um, that um, are, is explained in other places. So the conclusions um, of my uh, talk is the uncertainty factor, I think, I hope you'll agree, is a useful alternative way to press, express measurement uncertainty when the uncertainty values are high and when the frequency distribution is visibly uh, log normal, highly positively skewed. It can be systems that are purely analytical uh, applied to that and we've I've shown some here in con with contaminants microbiology and some GMOs I'm sure there will be others but particularly where there's inherent expectation of a log normal distribution and that was noted in that paper about potency um, for microbiology and for it's been noted in papers for PCR and it's also going to be applicable where you're sampling substantially heterogeneous materials like lead in that contaminated site. So it also allows for the variation of uncertainty with concentration, which I haven't got time to go into, but is another benefit. And it gives us this advantage of not having negative lower confidence limits. Moreover, it can give you more, more accurate upper confidence limits, which are particularly useful often in compliance assessments. Those few high values, for example. As you can see, its uncertainty factor is harder to explain, but hopefully it's going to be made more accessible through this Eurochem leaf leaflet I mentioned, and through use of that approximation I've just been discussing, where an uncertainty factor of 1.2 is roughly equivalent to a relative expanded uncertainty of 20%. So thank you for your attention, and I hope there might be some time for questions.